Board Member Bennett, Board Member Brogy, Present. Board Member Foy, Board Member Morgan, Present. Board Member Parks, Here. Board Member Pollock, Present. Board Member Rodimides, Here. Board Member Sharkey, Board Member Zaragoza, Here. Chair Long. Here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Morgan, will you lead us into the Pledge of Allegiance? Would everyone please stand? <clears throat> Place your hands on the heart. Ready to begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and every and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Next we have our meeting. Um, sorry, I just need to grab the rest of my stuff here. Thank you very much. Okay, can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. It's been motioned and second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any no's? It has been approved. Uh, next item is the agenda review. Are there any changes to this agenda? Can I get a motion to approve? Second. Thank you. It's been motioned and second. All in fa any questions? All in favor, say aye. 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 And any no's? It's approved. The next item is public comment. And seeing no public comment, we will move on to board comments. Are there any comments from the board today? Thank you for coming. I appreciate your time. One comment. Happy mm -hmm. Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Tomorrow. Because I've got to go do that. <laughs> That's great. Be careful. <laughs> All right, and see, um, on the consent agenda, can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Been a motion and a second. All, no questions. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any no's? It has been approved. Moving on to number 10, I receive and file this study session regarding the new state air quality legislation. We're moving and shaking today. Chair <laughs> Long, members of the board, Mike Fiegas, Air Pollution Control <clears throat> Officer. I wanted to take this opportunity to brief your board on some significant new air quality legislation. It looks like last year was probably the busiest year for air quality legislation in probably 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the first bill was Assembly Bill 1132, and currently the district has a hearing board, and our hearing board can grant a variance from our rules if there's a facility that needs to continue operating while they've had a breakdown. And on the other side, they can issue an order of abatement if there is a facility that is violating the rules and they're definitely not responding to our administrative actions such as notice of violations and, and fines. This bill would allow the air pollution control officer to issue an interim order of abatement in a situation where a facility is causing an imminent and substantial endangerment to public health. The APCO would have to have made an effort to work with the facility operator to come to an agreement on a stipulated interim order of abatement where both sides would agree on the actions before this order of abatement could be issued. We would also have to provide the facility operator with they, their terming in the legislation as accusation, but it would be the rationale behind our issu issuance of that interim order of abatement. And if the facility operator responded with uh, a notice saying that they disagreed with that rationale, they're calling it a notice of defense, we would have three days to schedule a meeting before the hearing board, and that hearing would have to be scheduled within 30 days of receipt of the uh, notification from the facility operator. Well, we're, yes. Uh, can I uh, just ask real quickly, I understand the district attorney can 
also, if something's violating Clean Air Act, the district attorney can get in there with um, uh, prohibition and injunction. That's uh, happened I, in the past in our county with Halico, I understand. Actually, in that case, the uh, district attorney filed. We basically turned our violations over, looking at the gravity of the violations and what we felt was an ongoing issue to the district attorney. They pursued a criminal prosecution, and one of the, the best things there is they that probation obey, obey all laws and orders, and we knew that in three years that probably wouldn't happen, so it surely right. didn't, and the op, you know basically the operator was left with shut down or face a violation of probation, which right. could include jail time. Thank you. So from what I understand on this policy is that you would have a person in your position be able to put a temporary hold until it's um, heard from the hearing board. Yes, exactly. So that's the policy, is to make a policy that if there's some need, that that would be the case until it was heard from the hearing. Exactly. If we ended up in a situation, what we want to be sure is that if we ever go this route, the, situa the situation warrants this level of action. and and. There's a fear amongst many of the APCOs throughout California that there would be pressure uh, to take this type of action based on some neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor disputes. No. And we want to avoid that. So before Correct. we took this type of action, we would certainly consult with the hearing board chair, uh, the chair of your board, and county council. And we'd also make sure that if we were looking at any risk assessment that we had done our homework and possibly uh, discussed it with another air district or the state office of environmental health hazard assessment but i think the core issue here is that as soon as we took something actually like this before we actually issued the order we'd already be in contact with the hearing board chair and we would need to get that hearing scheduled Correct. early enough that if the hearing board decided to go along with the order of abatement then i think everything's going to be just fine, and then we're, there should be, you know, adequate due process for the facility operator that route. The next bill is is good news for the air district. Uh, basically, right now, you are when you register after your vehicle is uh, six years old, when you register for that seventh year of operation, you're required to do a smog check. What ARB and the Bureau of Automotive Repair have noticed is that that smog check has a very high pass rate. So they're proposing to exempt vehicles in uh, years seven and eight from smog check. That means your first uh, smog check would be done with your registration for the ninth year of uh, operation. And instead of paying the $55, which is the going rate for a smog check, you would be billed $25 a year in years seven and eight. Those monies would go to the state for distribution to the Carl Moyer Fund to the air districts. Uh, for us, it looks at an increase of about $750,000, which is roughly about a 60, 65% increase for us. So that's, that's gonna be a nice chunk of change. And if you remember our district, since we actually rate projects on cost effectiveness, uh, we look to be the most cost effective air district in California with these monies. And we're also very lucky in the fact that we have a lot of agricultural equipment, so it seems like we have an endless supply of tractors, agricultural pumps, and then certainly the fishing and sport fishing fleet. The other good news is that uh, administ administrative funds would yes. be included, so if we had to add a half or a third of a person to handle these additional grants, that cost would be defrayed. Uh, can I just ask for a clarification? Seven and eight year old vehicles are exempt? They would be exempt from smog check. So instead of so, but is there some assessment that they don't create smog just generally because they're seven or eight? I don't understand. Well, what they've done is they've looked at the data for those those vehicles, and they're finding that the pass rate for those vehicles is very high. In essence, one of the things in California we've required onboard vehicle diagnostics, which really helps the mechanic out detecting issues with the emission controls. And the other thing is the requirements for the emission control warranties. Basically, they're making emission control system, uh, 
systems on vehicles much more robust and effective than in the past. Just and a quick so follow-up. So a car that is uh, a vehicle that's nine years old or six years old, do they still have to no, do that? No, the first smog check would be required after when the vehicle's eight years old, when you register for the ninth year of okay. operation. Okay, got it. I have a 16-year-old car. Thank you. And that one's in smog <laughs> check. <laughs> Good question. Uh, this ne next piece of legislation is probably the most significant piece of legislation in 30 years, and that'd be at the state level since the California Cleaner Act. As you're aware, the district, we focus on improving air quality on a regional basis in Ventura County, and we're focused on regional pollutants, ozone, and particulate matter. We develop a plan based on Ventura County to bring areas such as Simi Valley and Ojai, which are still exceeding the standards, into attainment with the standards. This legislation really focuses down at the community level. And this bill also contains some of the most aggressive time frames I've ever seen. With the California Cleaner Act, things were laid out where I think the agencies felt comfortable implementing. It was a lot of work, but this one is excre extremely aggressive in that the California Air Resources Board will need to have their board approve the initial uh, communities in California they're going to fall under this program by October 1st. It's a community-focused framework. They're looking for enhanced information on pollutants in specific neighborhoods, meaning where we have a monitoring system that's in place to look at regional impacts they're looking at monitoring down at the community level. So looking at impacts maybe even perhaps from a single facility. They would also, if based on that monitoring uh, results, if we saw issues that needed to be addressed, we would have to develop a specific emission reduction program for that community. The positive here is that we're seeing some additional incentive funding that's supposed to be targeted to these communities. Uh, first is the farmer program, which could bring the district in the neighborhood of a million dollars in additional monies aimed at agricultural equipment. And as you're aware from the Carl Moyer program, you see we have plenty of agricultural equipment. The other thing is there was an Assembly Bill 134 that was specifically designed to grant districts money for disadvantaged communities and it looks like we'd be receiving in this initial year about six hundred thousand dollars and when i get into the <coughs> potential candidates in ventura county you can see that agriculture is, is in and about those communities and then lastly uh, with the moyer program when you really look at it with some disadvantaged communities, we're already focused heavily on agriculture, so we're getting direct benefits there. In this first year, uh, ARB is requesting the districts move quickly with what they call no regrets projects. And I'm gonna talk about some of the impacts we see in some of the communities in asthma. Uh, one of the drivers a recent study showed is that diesel particulate is actually linked on a causal effect, not only exacerbating, but potentially creating new cases of asthma. What do, you mean of by, course, what do you mean by a no regrets project? They mean that if you implemented it, even though you haven't had time to go out and do all the monitoring work with the community, you know that you're re uh, oh, reducing okay. a, a pollutant that's of benefit in just any community and certainly theirs. And of course they're urging us to do community participation and we've clarified that doesn't mean community input on a project-by-project project basis, but maybe input on the framework for selecting those projects. This bill is going to require very close coordination between the air districts and CARB, and certainly the community, and that means environmental groups, environmental justice advocates, uh, the regulated community, and certainly elected officials and school districts, because let's face it, where you place a school can also impact the emissions associated with that site. CARB is going to be tasked with also creating a website that allows people from the community to look at emissions data in that community. So basically, we've already met with CARB, and we're starting to ramp up to be able to get them both the criteria pollutant 
and the toxics inventory data that we're going to need to so we can do they can actually provide this service on a statewide basis. Also, CARB is going to develop some initial guidelines on community monitoring, looking at what's already out there. There's some uh, monitoring at uh, neighborhood level in some of the refineries in the Bay Area and South Coast. And you may have heard about the city of Paramount in the South Coast District. We, I, you have, I think it's several uh, metal operations and they're flying elevated levels of chromium in that community. They've already basically got a network out looking at that. And the thing that I want you to be aware of is, is this, I don't know that the advocates of this legislation realize, but that equipment, just to set it up, is roughly a million dollars. And it's, it's a, a nearly a million dollars a year to basically operate that system and collect the data. They'll also be coming up with uh, recommendations on additional monitoring. And one thing that's interesting in this bill, it encourages community groups to be involved in the monitoring. And there are some very uh, good low-cost sensors coming on the market. However, they're mostly just focused straight on particulate matter. They wouldn't speciate between a metal or, or any other type of particulate matter. We want to actually create some partnerships with the community to make sure that when this data, if it's collected in one of the loca at a location in Ventura County, that they understand exactly what this data means, you know, compared to background in other parts of the state. Uh, the district would be responsible for quality assurance and quality control on this information also. Uh, with emission reduction programs, if we had a community selected and we actually had to uh, move through on an emission reduction program, we'd have to have a very transparent process so people understand which measures we're taking because the regulated community could be impacted and then mobile sources could be impacted. We do have a port in this community, so goods movement is certainly uh, something we need to look at. And we'd have to make sure that we're going to meet those emission reduction targets and do it by a implementation timeline that the community feels comfortable with. Some of the additional elements, and the first one's going to be pretty straightforward. They want us to look at our rules that apply to some of the larger facilities in and around these communities. And they want to make sure that our rules meet what's termed best available retrofit control technology. That's for existing facilities. And this is very similar, and this is one thing we actually let the legislature know, that we do this every three years when we come to your board with our uh, triennial assessment under the California Cleaner Act. We basically compare our rule book to the other non-attainment districts in the state, and, it, and we prove that we're implementing all feasible measures, which would be best available retrofit control technology. Then CARB is tasked with creating a website with all of these determinations on it so districts can access this information quickly. They already provide this service for best available control technology, which is new and modified facilities. And the other change in this bill is enhanced penalty provisions. There are several steps in the maximum penalties for air violations in health and safety code. And the first one is the one we refer to as strict liability. And it has a maximum fine of $1,000 per violation per day. And this legislation changes that from $1,000 to $5,000. And this was in uh, probably response to an issue at a refinery where there was uh, an accidental release. It was not the result of negligence. So basically, they were capped at $1,000. And basically, you had shelter-in-place orders, and the community was fairly well outraged and a thousand dollar fine didn't seem appropriate. Currently CARB is proposing that I come to your board and get approval on a proposed methodology to review communities in Ventura County by April of this year. And like I said, this is an aggressive time frame. And then by July of this year, we would submit our in initial uh, recommendations for communities in Ventura County. When you look at the basic tool for identifying these types of communities, Cal EPA has produced what's known as Cal EnviroScreen, and it's a mapping tool. And when you look at the red areas, these are probably the candidate areas in Ventura County that should be reviewed. Uh, the interesting thing here is when 
your board is up to, you understand what we're doing from a regional basis. When you look at the air quality in Oxnard and you look at the score for ozone, I believe it's, they're in the 40th percentile, meaning that they're basically in better shape than 60% of the areas in California. Air quality is quite good in Oxnard with respect to ozone. Uh, the, the federal standard, even the one that's under debate whether or not they'll keep it, is currently 70 parts per billion. Oxnard's design value is about 61, so they're in great shape on the whole western portion of the county. When you look at Simi Valley, their design value is 77, but when you look at Cal Enviro Green, Simi Valley comes up as a green area, whereas areas near the coast come up as potentially disadvantaged communities, and that's because this program takes into account uh, many different factors, even though, as I said, Oxnard scores well when you look at ozone, uh, fine particulate matter, PM2.5, and diesel particulate, they do receive the highest score in the state for pesticide, and that's pesticide application rates, not necessarily exposure. And if you remember, our board, your board approved uh, a funding from our district with the Strawberry Commission and UC Davis looking at uh, better tarps for the fumigation of strawberry fields. Those are now standard required by our agricultural commissioner. So you're seeing, I think, an, a decrease in pesticide application rates, but that research on them undoubtedly also was used on Watsonville and Guadalupe. So <laughs> everybody's emissions, of, I mean, application rates are dropping. It's just that we have a lot of strawberries in this community and we have them near home. So when you look at other scores where Oxnard uh, area, the, the western portion of the county sc scored poorly, it, it was hazardous waste and undoubtedly Helico and then the uh, area just inland, just inland from the existing Mandalay power plant where we're going to place the new homes that was oil field waste deposit there many years ago. Yep. Uh, impaired water bodies, and, and I need to dig deeper on what this means. And solid waste, certainly Oxnard has three closed landfills. So, But when you really think about it, those landfills are capped with gas recovery. So there are some issues. And when you really look at from a, a, an exposure burden, the air quality side on the West County is quite good. But where, when you look at the demographics, Oxnard scores with a very high asthma rate, and this is based on ER visits. And then when you look at the other uh, scores, cardiovascular disease, there's a, there's a, a <coughs> high score there also. That, and then when you look at things like high school graduation rates, uh, not speaking English, which they refer to as linguistic isolation, and poverty, these factors are included because those are, those are kind of factors that probably reduce the percentage of the community that is registered in a health care plan. For, Mike, so, Supervisor could you, Bennett. Could you tell us what's, what's the solid red area there? Oriate me on that map, please. Uh, that is... The darkest red. Uh, basically, I think it's more of the northeast portion of Oxnard there. And right. I'm looking at their data right now. So... And what is that? No, Rio is on the other yeah, side. Uh, Rio is on the north side of uh, the 101, which right. is yellow up there. So, so, I mean, it looked to me like it's uh, Rio Mesa High School. Is it the Rio Mesa Field, would be north of the freeway. North of the freeway. What's, it's, the, what's the solid red? Do you know, Mike? Uh, that looks like... Is that south of the freeway? I mean... Okay, that is... Uh, okay, there you go. The yeah, 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 much better. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, like I said, that's the northeast okay. portion there. One thing I've asked Mike is just to dig deeper. There's a lot of data. And the question is, is, you know, does asthma only for the particulates in the air, or is it for the allergens in the air? Because we have a lot of that. Heart, is it we have also seven dialysis, um, you know, in, in Oxnard. So is health, the eating, and so forth. So I can't say that the air that we breathe is the only cause to this, but it will help. Um, so that's where checking all the different data yeah. points so that you can then pick a correct place in our county to do to yeah. be the like said, we've just initially started delving into the scores on the specific census tracts and I think this is something we're going to go into much deeper before we schedule a public workshop with the community to go over this and see what kind of issues the community brings up 
based on their perspective. Mike, Mike, and the, <coughs> the concerns in Oxnard, is that because of the pesticide you said? Or? Well, well pesticide certainly is a very high score, but you, Because we got clean air. That, that's right, but when you look at pesticide application rates, that's what's included in this. That's and I said the thing you need to consider is that, you know, recently they're putting better and better tarps out there, and the application rates are dropping because not as much escapes into the air. And, so and more the, of it's trapped in the soil where we want it. And, and the contamination of Fifth and Harbor, that was re remediation on that. Yeah, it, it's it's still yeah, yeah, and see, that's the other thing. And some of these, when you look at things like solid waste, you've got three closed landfills. And, you know, most people are out there playing golf on them. Yeah. And they're not really a hazard, but it's increasing the score here. When you really look at it, those type of issues are not something an air district or this AB 617 is really going to be... They're increasing the score because it's a landfill, not because it's... Uh, exactly. It's okay. just it's based on how because close the there. landfill is to the center of the census tract. Got gotcha. you. So will you be coming to the board with the location that you pick before we submit Absolutely. this in? Okay. Absolutely. I, I want to make sure we all have back choices with on that. Some reports on the methodology right. we proposed and the results of the workshop. This is... I wanted to say Cal Virus Green a lot of times is used actually for cap and trade yes. decisions, which is really important for getting some of that funding to our disadvantaged communities in California. And yeah, it's certainly, it isn't just about the air, it's about exposure to even you know, power plants, et cetera, et cetera. So it can be very useful, but we need more information. So Absolutely. Yes. And as Thank I you. dig deeper in it, I looked at the, the area in, in uh, basically down in the Port Wayne area, Port Wayne area, and there you see the impact of uh, diesel coming up because certainly we have a lot of trucks leaving the port, that type of. Okay. But also we have a very uh, forward thinking port director, and we're already working together on a clean air plan with the port. So I think some of these monies are going to go a long ways towards cleaning up those operations near the port and moving through Oxnard. Uh, Mr. Mike. Morgan. Oh. What, <laughs> um, what they're doing in long, down in the port in Long Beach and so on, they've got the uh, hydrogen cells in trucks down there. That's been gone for a while. Um, is there any way of looking at that being a potential here? Certainly. Actually, we just uh, went in with the port on, they have some yard trucks uh -huh. that are basically just moving around the port and, and nearby uh, operations. And actually, they applied under the Energy Commission with our assistance uh -huh. for electric yard trucks. Uh, we'll be looking certainly at those cranes. And when you look at some of these funds coming in, uh -huh. when you see all this, this farmer money coming in, when you really think about it, I can displace some of the moyer I've been sending to uh, the egg community, and we can actually put those monies into diesel particulate reduction at the port. It's going to benefit that area because all that, tr all those goods movement, they're going right up rice to get to the 101. You have a potential for you know egg and chicken and the egg. You got to have a place to produce the hydrogen uh, in Oxnard at their sewer plant. Uh, I've been approached by people that want to do that. Um, we don't have that much, but Oxnard has it there. And it could be, you could produce hydrogen instead of putting in water and <laughs> to co to cost a lot of money and uh, putting electricity into it and producing hydrogen. You can put it into the, uh, the um, sewer plant and make it easier and less expensive. I'm just letting you know that ahead of time. It's being a little right. So you'll bring this. Yes, this will be coming back. Right. But Next slide. Somehow. I think when they enlarged it, I lost control. What was uh, that? Right now, just oh, gotcha. Thank you. Thanks. There you go. Your initial thought is certainly ARB wants us to look mm -hmm. at Cal Enviro screen. We're going to be looking at our toxics information we have in house already at these facilities in the communities, certainly at our emission inventories for criteria pollutants. <coughs> and the US EPA has developed a mapping tool similar to Cal Enviro screen called EJ screen, although in, in a little parentheses under it, it says not to be used to identify environmental justice communities, which makes you wonder why they started with EJ, but a little confusion there. But we'll be definitely working with the community and the regulated community to make sure that whatever you do makes sense. I'll be happy to take any questions. I think, thank you for letting us answer our questions as we go to make sure we're on point. 
Does anyone have any other questions? Mrs. Brody? Yeah. Um, With regard to the communities that are selected, uh, what is the criteria? Are you looking um, at where the contaminants are greater, does uh, air quality, um, or are there other factors that are looked at besides that? And how many communities are we looking at? I, I would, what I'm hearing is that initially there'll be five communities selected in California, but this is gonna be an annual program where additional communities are brought in. My guess is uh, the city of Paramount with the Chrome 6 problem they're having there and the refineries are probably going to be on the initial list, so I'm not sure that we'll see one in this county. But I think we can initially get started on this, and at least we'll be looking at our toxics data. You know, I let your board know that we're going back through the entire air toxics program with a new with new guidance that includes, well, basically it, it deals with the fact of early childhood exposure to air toxics. So it's going to be a closer look at all the existing facilities. So I think we're going to be able to accomplish a lot of the goals of this just through our existing programs. And I think in the out years, we may see a community included if, if it comes to that. Ms. Ramirez? It, it seems like you're reading from some document. It, could you share that with us? Oh. All this info, and maybe it's just your notes, but your, it's, the my, the it's, my, it's my notes and, and, and the legislation and the fact that I've been mm -hmm. meeting. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good right now. I'm the president right. of CAPCOA, so I'm, I'm right. sitting down. Tomorrow I'm meeting with the head of CARB and then the head of uh, the South Coast and Bay Area, and we're going to be going over this, so I'm just okay. able well, to absorb. Okay, for example, I would love to see that map uh, a little more close up. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I that can, kind of thing, if there, there's... Things you could send to us. I'd Absolutely. It. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Can I get a motion to receive and file? Second. It's been motion and second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any no's? It's been approved. On to number 11. Well, I think we all lived through, well, that was the biggest wildfire in California, and it was quite an interesting time for many of us. Initially, with most wildfires, our response has always been, let's deal with the smoke impacts, because smoke contains a lot of fine particulate in the 2.5 micron and smaller range, which is the most hazardous form of that particulate matter. The good news is, we used to, every air agency in the United States operated operated a filter-based particulate matter system that either ran every sixth day or every third day. So when you think about it, the best case would have been is you had a seven-day wildfire event, you would have collected three days of data and four days with no data. The other thing is that filter had to be weighed, so you didn't have the results for at least a day or two afterwards in, in the best case. Now we run real-time monitors known as beta attenuation monitoring at all of our sites which gives us real-time data. We upload it to EPA's Air Now website, which is available on a, on a link in our website, and we moved it to the front page during the wildfire, and it basically gave uh, the public information uh, basically on an hourly basis. So I think that was real good. And the other thing I want to commend our monitoring staff, uh, working with our IS group, our new meteorologist, uh, Laura Hodgen, uh, basically from a remotely looked at the data, updated the air quality advisories on the weekends. And, uh, you know, when people say millennials you know, aren't, aren't real hard workers, I, I'll contest that. The other thing you should know is she assisted the Navy. They were doing some uh, weather research on Santa Ana's, and she was up in, at, at 2 in the morning releasing uh, weather balloons from Thousand Oaks High School. So she, she's really been a, a godsend for us on these programs. The program improvement for us is going to be Spanish translation on our advisories on our website. And we worked with the, they have, we have an excellent translation service, but I think the counties is actually quicker. And with this kind of information, we're probably going to go that route. The other thing that came up is there were a lot of, we received a lot of calls because of the burning oil seeps. The Thomas fire ignited the natural oil seeps that are 
basically all over both sides of Sulphur Mountain. And if you've ever gone above Camp Arnez, the Girl Scout camp, that hike or mountain biking trail, if you will, it just has oil running down the side all the time, and it's just crude. And when the wildfire went, it was a very hot wildfire, it ignited these seeps. Luckily, our monitoring manager had the forethought, we had discussed this, we'd had three oil incidents in this county recently, so he said, let's keep three canisters conditioned, under vacuum, ready to go for grab samples in case another event occurs. And since it was burning oil seeps, we went out and I, I went out on that Friday based on some calls. We were receiving calls from the administrators at St. Thomas Aquinas and residents on Big Canyon a Road in the Upper Ohio. We took, ran out to grab samples, uh, brought them back in, had them analyzed at a contract lab. And basically what we found is at Big Canyon where we were getting calls, and this was a very smart move, and they decided that it smelled so strongly of the seeps they decided to uh, leave the county for a bit. Uh, we did pick up benzene at five parts per billion. Now, to put it in perspective, when you look at the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, their acute exposure uh, limit is eight parts per billion, but we were getting close. And the one I like to use in discussing with the public is actually a federal agency, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. They have a minimal risk level of six parts per billion and the nice thing, it's, it's, it very clearly states that it's for exposures in the 14 to 364 day range, which is appropriate for an oil incident or a wildfire. Uh, this was a picture I, I shared with your board, and that's just a, that's one of the seeps right next to 150. You can see the smoke coming from it. It's really smoldering more than burning. I did see some fire department video where there are actually some seeps with flames but most of them were, were more of the spoldering nature. And the reason I included me in there is just to give you a, a scale. And that canister, it's about the size of a volleyball. And like I said, we kept them ready to go and we rushed them to the contract lab. Based on the elevated benzene levels we saw, we decided to take time integrated samples. We were still getting complaints from St. Thomas Aquinas administrators. Uh, so we picked up this equipment and went out and we ran a sample and came in at one part per billion, which was good news because where the, my monitoring techs went out there that day setting up, they said you could definitely smell the seeps uh, at the campus and where they were setting up the monitor. One of the future improvements is I've attached the uh, memos we put up on our website is we're gonna ex expand the information to give the public a little better understanding uh, right now, we compare the numbers to the, the mean or the average that we collect at our Simi Valley site, which is actually a site we operate for the California Air Resources Board for Air Toxics. And, and basically, we're going to say, he, he, here's the range of the values we're seeing at, at Simi Valley, because it's most likely being impacted with benzene from vehicles on the freeway, so sometimes it's going to be high-low depending on wind and weather conditions. We also had concerns. Uh, excuse me, before you move on beyond the, the seeps, uh, yeah, I was seeing some photos of just in the last week, firefighters uh, trying to douse them. And, you know, so there's a lot of smoke or fumes coming out of it. And I'm just wondering, is that the best way, you know, you think about a, a grease fire or something, you know, they said don't, don't use water. I mean, is that how you address seeps is with water? Uh, I'm, I'm not the... <laughs> well, I, I will tell you, based on being at the CP every day, that was a huge conversation for the firefighters, for health, and for the community. Right. And so they had a lot of trouble trying to get them out. And actually, they had a foam retardant that was able to suppress and put it through. Um, they were looking at that and talking with our air quality and for hazmat. And we could ask them to come and discuss that more. But... Um, yeah, you'd think. They're always looking for the best way of controlling right. and, the and gases the, and the so health forth. of the firefighters. That is a big concern if they're out there doing that for extended periods of time. And mm -hmm. the idea that you could have like one FOS check fly over, dump it, and that might take care of it. I'm just wondering if there is advice going to how to best put them out with the least amount of exposure. 
Yeah, I mean, that's something I think that's going to be best. I've met with Dr. Levin and uh, folks from BC Fire that were looking into the seeps, and certainly the foam that they obtained from a company in New Jersey worked well once they learned how to mix it and apply it. And the, uh, you know, I believe this occurred before I started at the districts. I heard these seeps ignited in the 80s, and they were extinguished in a very heavy rain. So that, that tells me that water could work, or it did that time. So the ones I'm, the methods I'm familiar with are the foam and water. But right. They I'm flew in that component because they asked the USFS, yes, the United States Forest Service, about that with CAL FIRE because CAL FIRE with CAL OES and so forth have been dealing with that a lot. So I knew their resources were really working on that because they are worried about the community and the firefighters. Yes. We also had uh, concerns from some folks with Citizens for Responsible Oil and Gas looking at polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are uh, toxins that are emitted anytime you burn any organic material. So whether it's a wildfire, a fireplace, or burning a crude oil, you're going to emit some of these PAHs. So we, this is a very specialized uh, piece of monitoring. We actually consulted with the South Coast Air Quality Management District because CARB did not, they do not yet have this uh, ability to monitor for these compounds. They're going to be getting the equipment later this year. And they were kind enough to loan us a high volume sampler, a filter based sampler that we no longer utilize. And they had very good standard operating procedures. Uh, they set us up with their contract laboratory, and we had to get special filter media from a lab in North Carolina. And it took a few days, and they FedExed it here, and we actually went out to St. Thomas Aquinas, and we ran this 24-hour pH sampling alongside with our 24-hour time integrated for uh, the benzene compounds. And we got our results on January 12th, and South Coast was more than generous and actually worked up a a risk analysis for us that they provided us at the end of the month. It's attached to the board letter, but the main... The main thing we found is that basically the risk, and this is just a quick picture of where we sample it at St. Thomas Aquinas, but the risk when you look at combining the VOCs and the PAHs what we found with our VOC canisters held true. The interesting thing is benzene, again, one of the volatile organics, drove the entire risk. It wasn't the polycyclic uh, aromatic hydrocarbons. But on the acute, we had a hazard index of 0.12, and the action level for our district and the vast majority of air districts in California is 1.0 or so we were well below on the acute side. When you look at the cancer risk, and this is very difficult, and there's, there's def definitely uncertainty, but about the shortest period that you can actually model a cancer risk for is six months of exposure. So that's what South Coast had to go with. And when you really think about it, that's an extremely conservative assumption because the majority of seeps were extinguished within a month utilizing the foam. We still do have some seeps up near the top of Sulphur Mountain that are still smoldering, but obviously the emissions are dramatically reduced. The other conservative assumption is since we didn't have background information on polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, certainly not in that region either, we couldn't back out the background and say this increases because of the, the burning seeps. So we basically we had to assign all the emissions and all the risk to what we detected those monitors. I've also provided this information to the fire department already and we'll be consulting with them because I, I, I know there was interest on, on some of the folks on just working near the seats, certainly. I just want you to remember we're, we're definitely a regional air pollution control agency. We're staffed to monitor our five regional sites and uh, you know we I think we did the best we could under the circumstances. We got great assistance from South Coast, but to put it in perspective, we, you know, we had to bring our monitoring techs in on the weekend to maintain our monitors that we were not looking at because we were out picking up monitors from South Coast and setting up at the college, so. Well, um, thank you very much. I, I would like to make a point to state that I do agree with Supervisor Parks in regards to we should know 
what the best practice is for CAL FIRE or, or whatever, whoever is putting a sulfur fire out so that we don't have to kind of find, you know what I mean, that we could actually have that information that if there was any other emergency situation that we could provide that pretty easily. And I think, I think that's definitely worth us, at least our department, looking at that. Um, and so it will also help with the other hats that we wear. Sure, Correct. Yes. Fire department and all this. Correct. And then also I understand that the um, emissions during this disaster are not um, put into our numbers for the year for this air district. Is that correct? That's correct. When you look at the particular matter emissions during the Thomas fire, I have some data here that uh, Laura provided <laughs> me looking at Ojai. And, and, you know, it goes good, moderate with air quality, and then it climbs to unhealthy for sensitive, unhealthy for everyone, very unhealthy for everyone, and hazardous. Right. There were a couple of days in Ohio we, we were in hazardous. Actually, we were checking to see if our BAMs could actually read levels that high, whether it was a reliable number. And it, it, so what happens is we flag that data as a wildfire, as, and EPA refers to that as an exceptional event, and that it would not be counted against our monitoring data to say whether we're in or out of attainment. So I wanted to make sure everyone knew that, because that'll be important as we hit our numbers later on. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? Thank you very much for the technical data. I enjoyed it. Um, can we get a motion? Yes, uh, uh, Commissioner Brown. Um, throughout this whole Thomas Fire event, you know, we've had um, just all sorts of praises and the, uh, for the fire depart departments of uh, first responders and whatnot, um, and this is the first that I've heard about what your staff had, had done, gone over and above uh, what they normally would be required to do just to stay on top of monitoring the air quality. So on that note, um, I want to thank you personally and thank your staff for, again, acting as first responders. So um, thank you. And also with the masks. I know there was a lot of question on the masks and who do we talk to and who do we know and all that. So thank you for that education as well. We learned a lot about particulate masks in a very short time with Dr. Levin and OES. So. <laughs> all right. Uh, can I get a motion to receive and file? Second? Second. All right. It's been first and second. Any other further questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any nays? That's approved. Um, last but not least, I need to get a motion to approve to cancel our, the meeting of March 13th, 2018, regular board meeting. Don't jump all at one time on this one. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. aye. Any no's? Thank you very much. We will see you at the next meeting.